Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is 2018's The Midlands Expanded by Monkey Blood Design. Ok, first a bit of history. In spring of this year I was sent a copy of The Midlands by Monkey Blood Design for review. Having not heard of the setting before, it came as a genuine surprise as to how enjoyable it was, and is one of the best books I've read this year. Since I reviewed it, The Midlands has gone on to win an Any Award for the impressive cartography. The Midlands Expanded is a 224-page small-form hardback book that branches out to the rest of the Haven Isles, adding even more of its self-styled game juice to the setting. The package I received had a copy of The Midlands Expanded, a handy mini DM shield, a die drop card, more than that later, and a map of the Haven Isles, with art on the back. OK to the cover. I have to say, although there is nothing wrong with the cover, I much prefer the matte cartographic cover of the original Midlands to this one. The shininess just doesn't seem to fit the already established Midlands aesthetic, as well as the fact that with handling it has caused it to rub off. OK to the inside. Upon opening the book, we are greeted with a nice map and a picture of the Rat Dog Inn. This is featured in the scenario at the back. More on that later. We then have a nice little piece of art and a thank you list followed by a few content pages which are noticeably more concise than in the Midlands and in a foreword by the Swords and Wizardry creator, Matt Finch. Then we have credits and thank yous to various people, including yours truly. It then follows with some notes on the acronyms used throughout and includes some information on a creature that was cut out of the Midlands, the Mud Cow. These are covered later in the Beastery. It then launches into the reasoning for expanding the Midlands to cover the whole of the country and explains how they are known. The lands are Haven Land, which is England, Scotland, which is of course Scotland, Emeraud, which is Ireland, and Olden Whale, which is Wales. They're collectively known as the Haven Isles. It then has some thoughts on living as a Havenlander, and also how you can greenify your campaign with the use of Gloomium. It gives us some information on the highways and tradeways, and how they were originally constructed around 2,000 years ago by the invading Gomans, and are now only generally maintained where there is heavy traffic experienced, or where merchants require them. And then it moves on to the woodlands and the forests. Of note here is Avon Forest, which is said to contain the Great White Heart, a 15-foot high bipedal half-man, half-white stag, also known as Cairn the Antlered God, crowned with horns of iron and supposedly accompanied by a pack of seven huge white wolves. There are Chillington Woods, where deep below the King of the Henge Rats, Grindtooth, sits on a throne of dead rats, where he plots against the world above. We also have Dirtmoor, a mid the fog shrouded moor where Duke Salt holds the annual bog challenge, where participants must swim the length of a dugout trench with only a hollowed out marshland rat leg bone to breathe with. There is also Southerton Down Forest and Yerkmoor Forest, which is said to be the home of a green dragon, and an old folk prophecy warning about the return of beating wings above. Next it moves on to the islands of the Haven Isles. First is Angel Isle, which is known as Gwindonia's Food Basket, due to the amount of crops and cattle raised there. It's connected to the mainland by a huge bridge that is built to withstand ocean storms and howling gales. It's record only blemished by woodworms spreading through the timbers and strange midder fogs that have rolled in on occasion only to reveal a smashed bridge dripping with green ichor days later. Other isles of interest include Harren, the location of a gloomium spring that was covered year round in dense green fog and the home of many strange gloom warped creatures and gruesome beasts. We also have Lindifarne, the location of Lindifarne Castle and the Priory of the Holy Order of St Egbert the Even-Handed, and home to around a hundred monks and nuns. There's Lundy, the location of a ramshackle shanty called Pirate Town, which is every bit as debauched and run down as you can imagine, and the home of the self-styled Pirate King, Captain Arthur Nance. There is also Man Isle, where every year it becomes a magnet to those who want to race the fastest horses, mud cows and even dogs, known as the Great Race or TT. We also have Portland Isle, which is often beset by storms that cut it off from the mainland for weeks at a time and is home to Portland Prison, where the prisoners hunt slitherits, gloom-touched, hairless, rabbit-like creatures that undermine structures by burrowing underneath them. Also of note here is Twain Island, a place that is claimed by both Oldham Whale and Emeraud, with one side being protected by Lord Brokehoof, a strange, enigmatic goat man, and the other by a haggard elder called Evan Blackfleece, who don't want to fight each other, but are being provoked by the Queen's spies. After this, we move on to the counties and locations of Havenland. These are generally ruled by dukes or duchesses. We have Berkshire, also known as the Queen's County due to Windsour Castle being there. It's famous for its mud cow racing arena called Royal Mudcot. It also gives details on Windsour and Windsour Castle itself. It talks about Haven's End, the most suddenly tip of the Haven Isles, and also Taintedgel Castle, which is said to be where King Barth and Payne Dragon was given the mighty sword Caled Witch by the Lady of Greenmere Lake. It then moves north to Chester, which is close to the borders of Olden Whale, and Manchester, which is home to a strange path prison, a grim and foreboding place known to the locals as Damnation. It details Mount Felscar, 
the peak surrounded by olive clouds and covered in green snow. It then goes south to Devon and Blymouth, a place that is home to a military college, grey sheep and wild cats that are twice the size of dogs. We have Helm's Ford, a settlement that has existed since the Gomans that looks like two concentric circles and is replete with many trade guilds such as the Guild of Hedge Cutters and the Honourable Guild of Assayers. We have Riverpool, which is home to The Tavern, a drinking den known for its music and live entertainment, and Southerton, a large harbour town which is renowned for Welling Falls and its namesake inn, whose owner, Tall John, has a running offer of 50 gold quids for anyone who can prove they survived the falls in a barrel. It then moves to Blackover, which is known for its green cliffs, and Darkpool, a bustling seaside town that is home to a 100 feet high black stone monolith. There's Fern Barrow, that has a series of 13 stone heads, pictured here, lining the cliff tops, keeping watch over the town. We have Lesterne, a bustling town protected by Lesterne Castle and ruled by Duke Ebenezer Hawkins, a fair and popular leader whose eldest daughter has become resentful of his longevity. There's the port of Grimsburg, which is home to the Grim Tower, which is made of dirty red stone and is dominated by the Fishmongers Guild. Great London is mentioned, but this will be the subject of its own book. Next up is Queensmere, a poor town that straddles the Great Ooze River and home to Mere Keep and the Lady of Queensmere, Bertie Cleggan. And we also have Northwich, a walled town which has a cathedral to Mithra, and Nothamshire, which has Sherwood and Forest, which has within it the Great Oak, a tree that is 150 feet tall and over a thousand years old. There's Nottingham, which has an extensive network of labyrinthine caverns beneath it that the cruel Lord Blackthorn uses to cover up the twisted murders he commits. It is also known for its rune masters, who have begun a new technique of etching runes onto people using acid, a process that's still being perfected. We have Barrowburn Keep, otherwise known as the Keep of the Borderlands, which borders the Great Wall of Hadrine, which was built 2,000 years ago by the Gromans to keep the inexplicably angry northern barbarians out. We also have Grimacus Keep, named after the Groman centurion sorcerer Grimacus of the Crimson Legion, and it was allegedly held against the clan of Scottish marauders with just a hundred men. After this we have Midder Castle, which is built halfway along the Great Wall and acts as a gateway between the two countries. There is also Nouth Castle, which is known as the canniest town in the north, a claim that is disputed by the folk of Sundered who call it Nouth Castle due to there allegedly being nothing worth seeing. It moves on through the rest of the country with Oxenshire, known for the Uffer Horse, a huge, stylized, rearing white horse carved into a hillside with chalk. And then we move on to Stoke Pottington, a town entirely devoted to the craft of pottery. The lands are protected by a well-funded militia called the Clay Guard, and enforcement of the town's laws is fairly draconian. The town also has around two dozen clay golems, originally created to dig clay and drainage, and they are now rumoured to guard the mansion of Lord Hedgewood. It moves on to Colford, which is ruled by Lord Mastiff, who is secretly a trained assassin who escaped the Tower of London after being imprisoned there for the murder of Lambert Cleggan, the father of the current Lord of Queensmere. His past, however, is starting to catch up with him. We then have the aforementioned Sunderland, who have a fierce rivalry with nearby Nouth Castle, and then we move on to Starford, which has been ruled by the Star family for over 400 years. Here we have the Swanling Ring, an open-air theatre that stages plays as well as dog, cock and goblin fights. It talks about Broome, a large town that is dominated by the Lord's Tower, a large, strangely shaped tower with dagger-like appendages. At night, a green beacon is lit atop it to remind the folk that their Lord Assam Salem Hakim is ever-present. It then moves on to Coventry, named for the giant lone oak that once served as a meeting place for the Sisters of Heresy Witches Coven. And then we have Bath. Here, Queen Elspeth has been known to bathe in the Goman Baths, as it is alleged to ease madness. We then have Havenhenge, the largest stone circle in Havenland. Made of weathered hellstone, its purpose has been lost to most. There are those that know its true power, its magical entrance to Gloom Harrow Deep. We have Hull, a fishing town on the decline that has recently seen the return of Captain Graham Kingston from a 12-year journey to the west, who is shocked to see the state of his home port. We have Scarberg, which is also known as the town under the cliffs. It's almost invisible from land or sea. Finally in Havenland, we have Yorick, a former centre of Goman occupation that is home to Yorick Cathedral that is built of white stone, whose bishop, Magnus Tolheim, is known as the Giant, as he is seven foot tall and powerful of build. Okay, now we move on to Scotland. Scotland, much like Havenland, is divided into shires. Near the south of the country it is civilised, but the further you go north, the wilder it gets. It's a place of shepherds, lake druids and cold, unforgiving mountains. It has a clan system, and each shire is ruled by a thane. Of note in Scotland is Glass Hollow, a town renowned for their ability to work Scottish fire clay, and Kinningross, a blighted shire that is shrouded in fog that is the home to ghosts and spirits. There's the Highlands, the home of monstrous Vaco Magi, lock monsters and strange magic. It is a wild and dangerous place that is rumoured to be the home of hidden artefacts and dangerous beasts, and there's Mount Nevis, a barren double peak that is the home to the mighty Vaco Magi, giant sorcerers said to control the elements. 
We also have Edinburgh and its castle that has sat empty for around 200 years as it is occupied by the living dead. Skeletons man the walls and always repel invaders, never leaving. We then move on to Olden Whale. Pretty much like Havenland, other than being more rugged and green, Olden Whale is known primarily for sheep farming and trading. The land is ruled by clans and chiefdoms, ultimately ruled by Lady Keris Owain, who strives to keep the machinations of Queen Elspeth and Great London away from her borders. Of note here is Glamorgan, which is renowned for its mountains, that are known as the Black Jewels due to their numerous coal mines. And we also have Cairndiff, a great poor town that has a massive stone castle and is surrounded by a huge stone wall. This is where Lady Owain lives, and is generally considered, at least by the people that live there, as the jewel in Olden Wales crown. We have Herisfield, which has a sinister looking cathedral that looms over it, built from the bones of their enemies, and Gwynedd, where the minesweepers hail from. These are people that are sent into mines to clear out slate bangers, should they have an infestation. There's Bearmore, with a granite stone head known as the Watcher from the Shore has stood for centuries, and Mount Snow, the highest peak in Olden Whale that fledgling dragon singers ascend in order to further their training. Finally, we have Caer Olden Whale, a cliff-top castle that has a hundred foot high walls. After this, we have the Serpent Lands. These, on the map, are where Norway should be, but much closer. They are across the Dog Sea, and every attempt at exploring their land has met with the explorers being butchered and left on spikes on the cliff tops. Only one person has ever returned from the Serpent Lands to tell the tale, Olivia Issington. There are various rumours as to how she survived. Some say she used magic to escape, while others say she is a spy for the Serpent Lords. She resides in Great London, drinking herself to oblivion. We have details on the city of Hestakal, as well as some bits of information on their society. They have wooden longboats and plan to invade. The colour blue is generally used when describing the Serpent Land. We have mention of Gorlandia, the lands to the south and southeast of the Haven Isles, including Lakhalhay, the grimy port town where trade is conducted. Then it moves on to the coastal waters. Here we have various shipwrecks of note, as well as the gloomy and mutated gloom crab King Blackshell the Cancerous, who is over 600 years old and pulls ships to their doom when the mood suits. It also includes a small table of shipwrecks around the coast and where they sit, and also has a shipwreck generator table. Okay, on to the next section, oddities. Here we have strange items that can be found about the lands. Favourites include the Gripe Blade, an awkward weapon generally only wielded by warrior types, monks and rogues, that has vorpal effects. The Midium Ear Dagger, an assassin's weapon prized as they make no sound when coming into contact with anything. The Ring of Rat Speech, which, well, allows one to talk with rats and their kin. And the Wood Blade, that are forged from the wood of a tree that has been struck by lightning and can shock opponents in combat. Following this, we have some new spells. This includes Dragon Song, which allows the caster to emit a concussive cone of sound that disintegrates organs and pops eardrums, and Intellectual Intercourse, which allows the caster, after some conversation, to enter the mind of someone and see things they have seen. We then have some of the flora of the Haven Isles, including Nether Fern, which grows deep in the middle gloom, and if picked and used as bedding, can allow some to rest in half the time, but can also cause them to lose comp points, and Old Hobbs Acorns, which can summon an oak elemental when thrown to the earth. After this, we have the fauna of the Haven Isles, this includes such strange creatures as bog murmurs, which are strange will-o'-the-wisp-like things that can enter a creature's mouth, burrow to their heart, and after killing them, reanimate them. There's jelly glooms, huge translucent lime blobs that paralyse those who get tangled in their tendrils, and slate bangers, small implied creatures made from slate in the minds of Olden Whale that move with a simian gait and enjoy collapsing mines. Next it talks about the folks of the Haven Isles, and covers the dangers that they face, including various cults, guilds, lone wolves and pirates. These include the Black Dagger, a lone figure wreathed in black without a steed that speaks via telepathy who primarily steals magic items. The Black Druids, who are a sect that worship Ogthun, master of the Black Void, and attempt to kill as many common folk as possible. We also have the Cutlass, a privateer who works for the Queen, and the Red Lady, who was a wizard and rogue that robbed and murdered travellers, and now exists in undeath as a decayed, bloating corpse that murders. Following this, we have a few pages of notable personages. These are the game stats for characters that are scattered throughout the book and includes a sentient mud cow called Eobin that insists on being the best decorated beast in any party and talks in a gravelly broken voice. Some of the characters here starred in a scenario near the back of the book, while others have been mentioned previously. The next section details the new classes. First, we have the Witchfinder, a paladin-esque class that focuses on detecting and rooting out evil. The Highland Shaman, that are a strange cleric and druid hybrid that look designed to lead their clansmen into battle and the dragon singer, who are bardish in nature. Following the classes, we have the beastery. First up is the Branch Spike Golem, a construct made from forest detritus and vegetation that are infused with gloomium and created by malice-driven druids around henge sites. It also gives us the stats for gloom crabs and the Gloom Gull, a horrific human mutant that has been corrupted by years spent in the middle gloom. 
the Gloomium Dragon, denizens of the Middergloom that really come to the surface world, whose breath drains the vitality of its victims, and the Hugging Snow Beast, a creature that is covered in spines that kills those that inject with its bear hug attack. We also have the Leviathan, a colossal monstrosity that lives in the Dog Sea that is a mile long and a half mile wide, and has a mix of piscine forms, including tusks, blubber and tentacles. It is known to pull ships to their doom and even beach itself and destroy coastal settlements, although this is rare. It also has a foul offspring called Leviathan Spawn. After that we have marsh trolls, tattooed shamanic creatures that usually walk around naked, and then the mud cow with their strange tentacled and horned head that are used as pack beasts throughout the Midlands. Moving on, we have salt misers, a race of demon-esque spine-covered slug-like creatures that live on the moors, and also the shark folk, bipedal, half-man, half-shark creatures that live in the sea, but that can also come onto the land. There's the horrifying spawn of Morgonchilla, a giant spider-like creature that is covered in spikes and green pus-filled boils. There's the terrifying tentacled horrors of the Middergloom, which as you might expect are tentacled horrors that live in the Middergloom, that come in various sizes from lesser horrors to ancient ones. And there's also the Vacomagi, distant chaotic cousins of storm giants that live in the Scrotish Highlands, who wield lightning. Following this we have the scenario, the Rat Dog Inn. I'm not going to spoil it here, but players of a nervous disposition should probably avoid it. And we also have a fully realised location, Brig Tor, that has been put together in order to be worked into a scenario. Following this we have several pages of adventure hooks to do with places across the Haverland Isles. That again, I'm not going to spoil just in case a budding DM decides they like one of them. And this is followed by details of some of the more interesting hex locations. Places that fall slightly out of the remit of including them within the various place details earlier on in the book. Possibly due to the expanded descriptions. Although I'm not going to spoil them, a personal favourite is Ramsbottom's Moonboat, which actually made me laugh out loud when reading it. This is followed by the appendix, which gives a list of more superior beings, and then we have a list of all the dukes and duchesses of Havenland, and it includes a very handy flowchart of the relationships of them all. It also details the die drop card. This is a Gloomium Randomizer chart, or GRC. It is used for generating Gloomium infused random results, which ranges from bonuses and penalties to saving throws, damage, and dice multipliers. If the PCs are allowed to roll on the chart, the GM is advised to let the adversaries also roll on it. You can either roll and check your results, or literally drop a die onto the table and read it where it lands. The next page is a list of hidden signs and symbols of the Haven Isles, and this is followed by some tables on personalising equipment, and then followed by, rather oddly, a table for resolving burglary. And after this we have the open gaming licence, a large print of the die drop card, and fast stats for the creatures contained within. As I mentioned early on in this review, The Middlelands was probably the single book that most took me by surprise this year. I had no expectations going into it, and it gave me enjoyment far beyond its small stature. The Middlelands expanded, carries on where The Middlelands left off. The criticisms I had of the original book were clickable Wikipedia links in the main text, an overly large hex map location list that was perhaps too thorough and taking up too much space at the front of the book, the humour being a bit too English, as some oddities amid the layout. And Monkey Blood have genuinely listened, as none of these things are an issue now. This book felt a bit tighter and more finely tuned than the Middlelands, although the Serpent Lands, at least for me, sticks out a bit as something that maybe could have been left out, or preferably given its own book, as they had a strange snake Viking hybrid that, although pleasant to read, didn't really fit the already established aesthetic. I do think that the Midlands expanding beyond its own very green and unpleasant land setting may cause it to lose some of the charm it has in abundance, and littered throughout are absolutely loads of expansion book opportunities that the authors could easily jump on. The art ranges from good to outstanding, especially in the B-series, and as per the Midlands, the production values are as good, if not better, than many much larger, much better funded gaming companies, and again, it has lots of small touches throughout that show the love and care that has been taken with the setting, such as the incredibly handy double bookmark, and the fact that no space throughout it is wasted, every page has something to offer. OSR is very popular at the moment, and the award-winning Midlands can hold its head up with pride at the wonderful place they've created, that I really wouldn't want to visit. I give the Midlands Expanded a very deserving 8.5 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel and check out my other reviews. Also, if you're interested in buying this product, I've put some links below. Lastly, if you enjoy what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon. But out.